We launched here in Australia six and a half years ago, May 2013. Um, full of hope and actually a business model that looked like it was going to function. Like, there was no reason to believe otherwise. We've been going for 199 years and it had been fine. And then suddenly, within a year and a half, the entire digital advertising model imploded because every single new dollar started going to the Google and Facebook duopoly. Suddenly, the entire business model for publishing had gone and you found that there were lots of new publishers all around us and existing publishers who've been around for years who are cutting staff, closing offices all around us in Sydney soon after we'd launched with this real intent to make a difference and to be the only independent news that there was in this country. Um, just to be clear, um, our independence is underpinned by something called the Scott Trust, which actually owns The Guardian. So that part of us has always been purpose-driven. It was created over 100 years ago to safeguard the editorial independence of The Guardian in perpetuity. So when you think about shareholders driving financial results or a particular owner having a particular view on things that has obviously been much of the debate in Australia recently, um, that's something that we've never had. We've always had an editor who's able to make decisions, who has no... Um, directive from a commercial person whatsoever. So it's quite extraordinary. Um, but still, we never had a commercial purpose at our... We never had purpose in our commercial core. So we realised that it wasn't functioning. Um, and at that time, our editor, and our global editor, released an essay to, to sort of bring our purpose into the new era. And this was something that we could actually grab onto. It was something that commercially could make a difference. So she talked about us using clarity and imagination to inspire hope. And that is the purpose that we sit ourselves around today. And that gave rise to an entirely new business model, which was using the content, so brand content that we'd always done, but doing it with brands where we could actually use our trusted voice and help them tell stories about important things that were happening in the world, things that they were getting involved with, and actually have an impact on consumers' lives that was really beneficial by doing that. Still doing display advertising as we'd always done, but then opening up a whole new world of saying to the readers who support us and to, in fact, all of those who value us, please support us. And so within three years... We are now at a point where 50% of our sustainability, of our funding, comes from people who pay for something that is free. They can access it anyway, and they pay for it because they believe it's that important. And times like the last couple of months that we've seen lead to more people thinking that that's really important because they can see that our model is under threat um, and they want to contribute to having something like this voice in Australia. But also, another growing area is philanthropic funding. So still being entirely independent, no cash for comment, no influence whatsoever from a philanthropist. But if they've got an area of interest that we do too, then we will work and find a solution of something, an area that they can help us support or they can, they can fund. So we have, for example, an Indigenous journalist who is funded by something called the Balnaves Foundation. So they don't see what she's going to write until she's written it and they don't understand the impact until we've had it, including things like the World Health Organization deciding to act on a particular virus that she'd reported on that not, no one was doing anything about. So they see the impacts, but they see them once they've happened because it's, they don't have that role. But they, again, value us and think that that's really important. So in terms of support, as I say, we're now at a point where 50% of our funding comes from those people who are valuing us, those readers who on a day-to-day -day basis think that what, the kind of reporting that we do is super important. And some of that comes from this kind of thing where we say, we really need to do this level of reporting. We, we're at a climate crisis. We think this is super important to focus in on this particular area. Will you please help fund us? And both times that we've done that, we've raised over 150 k within two weeks, one time within six days. And we were the first market out of the, Austra the three um, Guardian markets to reach sustainability, to reach a place where we are, have a sustainable model. It doesn't mean it lasts long term, and if you want to talk about any of these different ways of working with us, then please do. But it was really exciting that we'd only been here six and a half years compared to our parents in the UK who've been there 199 years, and people think that it's that important. So we are in a position to talk about how 
you know, pivoting to purpose commercially can make a difference. We have got it wrong too. So one of the things that we talked about doing was about getting closer to our readers. If you're going to get closer to those people, if they're going to think that what you do is really important, if you build a relationship with them, that is how we will get closer and then want to fund something that's free. So actually in the UK, they bought an event space, put a lot of money into that, possibly forgetting a little bit our core purpose, which is to provide independent journalism in perpetuity. Events can be great, but it's not actually our core purpose, and it's not using clarity and imagination to inspire hope, which is what we're there for. So the minute we strayed actually from our purpose, we kind of realised it wasn't working, and financially it didn't work for us, and came back to that key purpose. Um, and just in terms of the kind of content that we've been creating, now I never, I've worked in the brand content sphere at The Guardian, so I've worked at The Guardian for five years, I've worked in brand content for all of that time, and the philanthropic and um, kind of different corporate um, partnerships for good are a, different, are a new stream of what I've been working on. But this kind of thing I've worked on for years. Now, if you asked me at the beginning, is there any chance you would have worked with, or what's the, the, the most unlikely brand that you'll work with in your time at The Guardian? I probably would have said Coca-Cola. And here we are uh, working with Coca-Cola, but on something that I am super proud of. So Coke last year got to the place where 100% of their single serve bottles are now made from recycled plastic. And that's not just important because it's not putting more, ocean, more plastic in the ocean. It's actually important because it's creating a market to pull plastic out of the ocean. And there is not enough of a market for that recycled product. And they actually innovated to the point where that carb the carbonation of the, bot of the um, liquid isn't something that makes the, bottom, the uh, recycled plastic not be able to handle it. Basically, virgin plastic is much, much stronger than recycled plastic. So they innovated to the point where they were able to do that. Now, they came to us and said, can you, I mean, not quite can you do a puff piece on it, but that kind of idea, can you, can you tell the world how great we were? We're like, no, but what we can do is do a whole piece which helps educate people, a whole kind of series that will educate people on the importance of recycling, on the importance of that container deposit scheme where you put in bottles and you get some money back, because that creates a cleaner waste stream. So that educates our consumers, it gets our readers doing something that they can really believe in, and then that Coke have been associated with that, and they also get the, the kind of kudos that they deserve for what they've worked on without it being a puff piece for what they've done. And believe me, I'm not saying that everything they've done is perfect, but if brands like this can pivot and can start doing things that are genuinely very good and create a new market for it with their size and scale, that is the kind of thing that we do want to encourage. And if it can help with their money get more people recycling through a cleaner waste stream, then I'm super proud of what we're doing. So it's really exciting. And then in terms of as a business ourselves, the kind of things we've been doing is actually taking that internal action to make sure that, yes, our editorial has always been purpose-driven, that, yes, now our, our commercial and our business model is actually purpose-driven too, but now actually we can look inside the business and we can go, we've become a B Corporation. That basically means that we've submitted to the highest possible standards across employee engagement across how we treat our customers, how we treat our environment, our governance, etc. Um, so, and they, and one of the most important things about becoming a B Corp is that they force you to keep getting better. So that's like signing up to keep on improving. And we've also committed to reach net zero emissions by 2030. So it's a really exciting time, and it is something that's through the core of our business, really authentic through everything that we talk about. So instead of it being as it was before, just an editorial stance, people can look at us and go, I actually believe in what these people are doing, and I'm therefore happy with it. And I don't know how many people saw, but we made the um, announcement last week that we will no longer take any advertising from fossil fuel extracting companies. So we're the first media business to just make that decision. And of course, we financially lose out through advertising. But we hope that, that doing these kind of things are the things that our supporters will think are sufficiently important that they will help keep our sustainability and help fund us. So how does this all apply to you? And that's kind of, I suppose, what most people are probably here for. So um, I love this quote because... We, so many people will be in non-purpose-driven businesses and feel like there's not a lot they can do. But taking back some of the stats around how you can make a difference and how it will make a difference to your bottom line can help shift the conversation. 
And it's all about doing what you can. Because if you start with as little as you can do and start making improvements from that and see a benefit to the business, that's when people start listening. So the one thing I hope you do is walk out of here with one thing that you genuinely believe that you can do within your own business or organisation that you work for. So I'm going to take you through kind of five steps. They're loosely based on a few different models that I have kind of come into contact with um, in my time looking at this area. And you might have guessed I'm a bit of a geek about it. Um, so in the middle, we've got the um, Unilever Make Purpose Pay study. And it's something you can pick up online. And there's a lot of detail in that. So it's loosely based on that. But it's also based on Good is the New Call, which is a book model podcast, um, whatever, all of these different areas um, by Aftel Aziz and Bobby Jones and something that's really interesting to follow in this space. But also the League of Entrepreneurs. And for anybody who does feel, I can't make the changes I want to within the business I'm in, I would highly recommend looking at the League of Entrepreneurs because it's all about helping to shift the kind of place where you're at to get that entrepreneurial social vision to make a, a better world within an existing big business and to, so to really increase your impact. So they're a really good resource to have a look at. But it's just kind of bringing together all of those with my work with the Banksia Foundation, which I'm on the board of, um, and having done a course around sustainable leadership. So hopefully these five sort of steps will be enough to help you on the way. The key thing about purpose is that it absolutely, the top thing, and I said it kind of close to the beginning, is it's about authenticity. When it doesn't connect in with what you are, then it stinks. And people can see it a mile off. And that's why you have the kind of errors you get with things like Pepsi and Kendall Jenner, if anyone's familiar with that. Pretty shocking example. But it's about understanding what your values and beliefs are, what role you already play in consumers' lives, in your audience's life, what are you there for? What does the world actually need? How do those intersect? And what is your role therefore going to be? It's absolutely about connecting all of those pieces in the most effective way. We've all seen a brand that's like talking about breast cancer when they're doing food and it's not actually connecting the two. And it's those kind of moments when you're just like, well, I don't understand how you play that role. Um, I show the UN sustain, uh, sorry, Sustainable Development Goals just because you may or may not be familiar with them, but they're a really good framework and blueprint for understanding what the world needs. So that's a really good place to start with how do you intersect what you're already good at with that. Now, Airbnb are one of my most favourite examples of a brand that really defined their purpose that didn't start off of a purposeful business. They started off as something that was basically people trying to pay their rent, realizing that there was a bit of an opportunity because there was more people in town than, than there were beds for, and literally putting air beds on their apartment floor so they could pay their rent. And that has pivoted into an extraordinary business that is about helping people belong anywhere. And when they say that, they really live it through everything they do. So we've just been through the summer we've been through, and their open homes program that has been running globally for lots of different areas, lots of different issues, has opened up. So people can offer up free accommodation, free beds for people to come and stay with them when they've been affected by the bushfires. That's happened with refugees as an ongoing program, open homes when, people, when refugees land in a new place for people to help welcome to that place. But also you may have seen the um, Until We All Belong ring that they did a couple of years ago. It was a campaign that, uh, that they brought on board all of these different brands across Australia with, a, with a, a, a ring to show that until marriage equality was real, that everyone would wear this ring saying, Until We All Belong. So an enormous thing of actually helping everyone belong. It's super important to be relatable and relevant. So you, it's, you, you define your purpose, you take that action, but then you also make it relatable and, and relevant. So one of the things that Unilever talk about is talk my world. So even if the thing that you realise that you can make a difference to isn't actually directly in the sphere of your audience, you can still make it something that connects with their hearts. Lush is a fantastic example of something that brings it very, very close to home. They have a youth audience who really, really care about making a difference with the climate. They live it through all their products. But something like the climate strike that becomes so, so important to that kind of audience, well, they're right there in the middle of it. They've closed their office, they've closed their shops, and they've got a sign up in the window that really, really connects with those people. 
Making it cool and helping fans advocate is one of the most important things to making purpose pay, which ultimately is why I'm talking to you. It's not just about talking about purpose being important, purpose being emotional. It's about you've got to, like, if you want to make anything work long term, you've got to make it sustainable financially. So it is about making it pay. Now, Adidas, you may have seen this a couple, it was uh, this time last year, but basically, Adidas in um, 2017 made a million pairs of ocean plastic shoes, so pulling that plastic out of the ocean in order to make shoes. It went obviously fantastically well, a million pairs of shoes. So to up the ante and to make it actually cool the following year, they took over Bondi Beach's Icebergs Pool. I know we're in Melbourne, I wanted to find a Melbourne example, I'm sorry I couldn't, but this is my home, so anyway. Um, and um, so when they emptied the, the pool once a week to clean it out, and they said, clean out the water, this became a tennis court, and they brought in, it was at the time of the Australian Open, they brought in Australian Open tennis players who went in and played a, a game right in the middle of Iceberg's tennis pool. I'm sorry, I <laughs> tennis pool. Um, right in the middle of the swimming pool. And this is one of the most iconic sites in Australia. And this image has gone global and really made that ocean plastic that entire new range that they had, well beyond the shoes, the tennis wear, all these new pieces of equipment, something that people really wanted to get their hands on. But also it's about helping those who have converted look at something different and be able to provide it to their friends. It's about making them become advocates for you. So this is something in the Guardian Labs area of what I was talking about earlier, where we work with brands on content that can genuinely be purposeful and help make a difference in people's lives. This is a interactive with Future Super, where people put in their super fund, and then it would show up to them immediately what they were invested in. Now people are just beginning to realize that where your super is invested is actually one of the biggest differences you can make. It's much greater than avoiding plastic, pl avoiding plastic bags and the like. Where your money is invested is actually the biggest thing that you can do. So if you haven't and you do care about purpose, I highly suggest you look at it. Uh, this evening. But so that kind of work we can do because we have that trusted voice and it can really help those people who are already thinking about it advocate amongst their friends. And then lastly, in terms of the sort of five rules that are just so important, is building a consistent message. It's not about advertising, it's about solving problems. You may have seen Gillette, you may have seen Pepsi and Kendall Jenner. This ad in particular was... Um, received such a mixed reception. It's an advert. Ultimately, it's an advert, and that's all it is. But people lauded it for moving things forward and talking about toxic masculinity. But then other people shot it down because they're talking about toxic masculinity, but then there's nothing within the Gillette brand that shows that that's actually something they're trying to combat. And in fact, they make razors for women that cost basically double the exact same product they made for men and they were doing nothing to fix that within their own business. So sure, they gave some money to some charities to help men become slightly different, but it ultimately was just a piece of advertising. And as long as you do something that is just advertising, your purpose piece is going to fall flat because people will see right through it. Something I probably banged on a little bit about. Um, so the purpose of a business is its reason for being. I say, you know, I was talking about earlier, like when we all came together under the purpose, uh, like for the new era, uh, for the new era that our Guardian editor put together. Suddenly, we've got a north star that we're all working towards. And when you do something that doesn't align with your north star, you realise it pretty quickly because it doesn't sit right. So it can unite all stakeholders instead of having different people within a business who are kind of fighting against each other because they've got KPIs that don't work. And actually, we've been through that. It actually generates trust and enables value creation. It allows people to think in a more creative and innovative way because they've suddenly got that excitement of doing something um, and, and understanding that they can make a difference. But it can also prove to help companies better, well, as I say, innovate, invest, serve customers, and engage employees. This is the year, you know, we've talked so much already at Pause 2020 about the summer we've just seen and how much pain people have been through. This is the year when this stuff is going to matter more than ever. And it's so important. People have always talked about brand love, but it's more important than ever to give people a reason to love you, not to 
to boycott you, but to actually choose that you are the better place. And you ultimately, per that stat that I mentioned at the past, in, sorry, at the beginning, is that you can help them feel, those eight out of 10 people feel better about what they're doing in the world because they bought from you. And that is just so crucial. So it's about making it easy for them to love you. I genuinely believe that we can be a force for change and happy to talk to anyone about it. Thank you.